ecstatic, in the literal sense of outgoing, embracing others. Moved by this outgoing, ecstatic love, the Trinity creates the world, not as an act of necessity, but as an act of sovereign freedom and unconstrained choice. For love is always free. Without freedom there is no love. And so the creation of the world as an act of love is also an act of total freedom. But this act of total freedom, this act of creating the world, is in no way arbitrary or coincidental but it is a true reflection of the unchanging inner life of the Trinity as mutual love. Now let's note another significant feature in Rublev's icon. The three angels are seated around a cube-shaped a cube -shaped table that strongly resembles an altar. The hands of all three are pointing to a cup that lies in the centre of this table. In the original story, this cup contains the head of the animal that was brought for the three angels for their meal by Abraham and Sarah. But in fact, this cup containing the animal's head resembles a chalice. And this brings us precisely to the aspect of mutual love according to the image of the Trinity that we have not so far discussed. The altar, the table, round which the three angels sit, is a table of sacrifice. The cup in the centre is a chalice of sacrifice. The Trinity as self-giving signifies sacrifice. If we are to reproduce on earth the mutual love of the Holy Trinity, then because we dwell in a fallen world, a world of sin, a broken world, suffering, fragmented, then we can only do so through canotic, sacrificial love, Trinitarian love in this world has to be suffering love. In the divine life, Trinitarian love is joyful self-fulfillment. Here on earth, mutual love after the image of the Trinity is also joyful and also means self-fulfillment. But because of the fact that we live in a world of sin and of suffering, a world of pain and loss, we have if we are to truly love after the image of the Trinity, to be willing to suffer. Now that is why I think in Rublo's icon the table is shown as a table of sacrifice and it bears in a chalice the head of the sacrificial victim. We are to apply to Rublo's icon of the Trinity that strange phrase in the book of Revelation 13.8, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Within God's eternal plan to create the world, there was also included the sacrifice of the Son. So, Trinitarian love, even for the divine three, means self-emptying, chaotic love, a love that embraces sacrifice, a love that embraces suffering. And that is how it has to be.
for us on earth. So, in Rublov's icon, the three are speaking in their dialogue of shared love. Of shared love that involves self-empty. They are speaking not only about the creation of the world, not only about the human race, but about all that is to come after. How creation will lead to the fall, how the fall will be followed by the incarnation, and how the incarnation will lead to the crucifixion. All this is included in the pre-eternal council, in the dialogue passing between the divine three. The three are speaking about the oblation of the Son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. John 3.16 The gesture whereby all three point to the chalice indicates that they are all alike sharing in the Son's self-offering. Such is part of the deeper meaning of Rublov's icon. It tells us that the mutual outgoing love of the Trinity, expressed in the creation of the world, expressed in the creation of the human person, is at the same time a sacrificial love. In total solidarity with the world, God the Trinity takes responsibility for all the consequences of the act of creation. The sacrifice of the Son did not commence only at Bethlehem or on Calvary, but it has its source in the timeless life of the Trinity, in the pre-eternal council of the three. The French Orthodox monk, who wrote under the name a monk of the Eastern Church, Father Lev Gillet, said, there was a cross in the heart of God before there was one planted outside Jerusalem. When God the Trinity then willed the creation of the human race, this was by an act that was already sacrificial. Now all of this has far-reaching implications for our understanding of what it is to be a human person after the image and likeness of the Trinity. It means that we are called to love one another with a love that is costly and self-sacrificing. If God the Father so loved us that he gave his only begotten Son to die for our sake on the cross, if God the Son so loved us that he descended into hell on our behalf, then we shall only be truly human according to the image and likeness of the Trinity if we also lay down our lives for each other. Without kenosis, self-emptying, without cross-bearing, without voluntary suffering, there can be no genuine likeness to the Trinity. Let us love one another, that with one mind we may confess the Trinity. Means nothing less than, let us lay down our lives for one another. To be a transcript of the Trinity is to follow in the path of the martyrs. Yet, in so laying down our life in Trinitarian love, we again find it in the risen Christ. Self-emptying means self-fulfillment. Kenosis means pleurosis. Out of death comes new life. Such is the constant experience of the saints in every generation. And such also can be your and my experience if with our whole self we think the Trinity, live the Trinity, pray the Trinity. Now, as a final epilogue,
to my talks about the Trinity. Let me recall a story told by Fyodor Dostoevsky in his masterwork, The Brothers Karamazov. It is a folk story that he heard in a village and he included it in his novel. Once upon a time there was an old woman and she died and woke up to find herself, much to her surprise, in a lake of fire. Looking out from the lake, she saw her guardian angel walking on the bank. There has been some mistake, she said to the angel. I am a very respectable old lady. I shouldn't be here in this lake of fire. Ah, said the angel, do you ever remember an occasion on which you helped somebody else? She thought hard and then she said, yes. Once upon a time I was gardening and a beggar came by and I gave her an onion. Excellent, said the angel. I happen to have that very onion with me now and he reached into his robes and he brought it out. And he said to her, you take the other end of the onion and I will pull. Perhaps it was, this is not Dostoevsky's comment but mine, perhaps it was a shallot rather than an onion. So she took the other end of the onion and the angel pulled and she began to emerge from the lake of fire. But she was not the only person there. And when the others saw what was happening, they crowded round her and hung on in the hope of being pulled out as well. This did not please the old lady at all. She began to kick and shout. Let go, she said. Let go. It's not you who's being pulled out, it's me. It's not your onion, it's mine. And when she said it's mine, the onion snapped in two, and she fell back into the lake of fire, and there, so I am told, she still is. That is Dostoevsky's story. Can we not give it a Trinitarian application? Surely the old lady should have said, not it's my onion, but it's our onion. If only she had been willing to share her onion, if only she'd been willing to say, not it's mine, but it's our. Would not the onion have been strong enough to pull them all out of the lake of fire? But when she said, it's mine, she was denying her own personhood after the image of the Trinity. She was denying God one in three. God who is mutual love. God who is sharing and solidarity. So if you and I are to be faithful to the doctrine of the Trinity, if we are to be true transcripts of the Trinity, if we are to pray the Trinity and live the Trinity, let us always say, not me, but us. Yeah.